practically everyone in the world is asking, how long will the COVID-19 pandemic last? This lecture covers seven big unknowns which make answering that question practically impossible. While we need to provide projection models to policymakers, we also need to humbly recognize that there will be surprises along the way that may make reality fall far away from our projections. The seven big unknowns I will cover today can cause such surprises. The talk is divided into two parts. The first part describes what the reproductive number, or r naught is. And the second part reviews various factors that drive the epidemic curve. So, what is the reproductive number, or r naught? Simply put, r naught is the number of other people to whom one person with an infection can transmit an infectious disease. In this example here, we can see that crowding has something to do with the level of r naught. If you have people who are living in a more crowded situation, or if they're on a bus together or on the train, we can see that r naught is high. In that case, one person can transmit the disease to more than one other person, in this case, three. But if you have less crowding, or what we term more social distancing, putting distance between people, then r naught will be lower. In this case, one person is transmitting it to two other people. If you have aggressive social distancing, then r naught can actually fall down below 1. Now, the other aspect is if one person gives it to 3, then this person can give it to 3 more, this person can give it to 3 more, and this person can give it to 3 more. Ah, so that ends up with a situation in which one person ends up giving it to 12 others, who then give it to even more. So if you have a very high r naught of 3, you can very quickly have an explosion in the number of cases. The same thing with r naught equals 2. 1 will give it to 2, and then these two will give it to 4. 4 will give it to 8. So the exponential rise will be less if the r naught is 2. If the r naught is 1, then that one person is giving it to one other person, and that person gives it to another. And so you sustain it. Instead of having a, an exponential rise, you'll have a stable number of cases appearing every day. If r naught decreases below 1, then you have a case where the number of new cases every day is falling or decreasing. So what are the effects of crowded housing? Now, this brings up an interesting aspect of public health. In a particular population, what you must understand is there are some places or some groups of people that where there's more ability to social distance and others where they have less ability to social distance. Typically, people who are less wealthy live in more crowded situations. People who are more wealthy live in less crowded situations. But this brings up one of the social determinants of health, right? Where wealth can actually result in some change in the ability to avoid disease. What happens is, in this case, inequities, social inequities and health inequities, where you have some groups being more affected by a disease and by the pandemic, for example, and others who are less. And the reason for this difference is nothing to do with physiology, but with the social condition of those people. The other point here is that social distancing reduces the r naught, and of course, it can reduce the r naught to, to lower than 2. These are just examples. So what factors can affect r naught? The first is the rate of contacts. The rate of contacting other people is reduced by social distancing and lockdowns. If you have people in the population not working, then they're not mixing, there's social distancing, and the rate goes down, so the r naught goes down. The second factor is the probability of transmitting infection. This is reduced by using personal protective equipment, or PPE. 
PPE can include items such as face masks, gloves, hand sanitizer, but the probability of transmitting infection can also be reduced by other actions, such as sanitizing the indoor environment, at home, at school, or in the workplace. But you can know for sure that when you do these things, you are part of reducing r naught for everyone. It also is reduced by reducing the susceptible fraction in the population. We'll talk more about this later, but the more people who have immunity, the lower the r naught. The third factor is duration of infectiousness. At present, we have no way of reducing the duration of infectiousness. Perhaps in the future, with therapy, this could be achieved. The second part of this lecture describes what drives the epidemic curve. This figure shows a typical epidemic curve, which is generated by what's called a susceptible infected and recovered, or a SIR model. The r naught in this model is 2.3. And let's just assume for the moment, no social distancing. Everything is going on as normal in everyone's life. And then we have this epidemic. So let's take a look at this curve. It begins low. And then what we see is an exponential rise in cases. And if you think about the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen this very sharp rise, OK? In, in a typical epidemic, and again, let's assume no social distancing, what we would see here is that this would rise, and then it levels off, and then comes down. And this is why we call it an epidemic. There's an exponential rise, and becomes flattened at the top, and then it starts to decrease exponentially, down, and then the epidemic ends. Up here, corresponding to that curve are the susceptible people and the recovered people. So at the beginning, everyone is susceptible. They've never had this disease before, such as like COVID-19. Everyone is susceptible and no one is immune. Now, and no one is recovered because no one has had it yet. So as you begin to go through this epidemic, there are people who recover and they will start recovering and at the same time, because they're recovering, and if they develop immunity, the susceptible fraction goes down. So what is the effect of the susceptible fraction being reduced? Well, this reduction here drives r naught downward. Now, halfway through the epidemic, you can see that many people have recovered and that the susceptible fraction has been reduced. Now, Another point to note is that there is an exponential rise in cases here. After this exponential rise, something very interesting happens. It begins to flatten. And we ask the question, well, why does it flatten here? I want you to think about that. Well, the reason it flattens is because the susceptible fraction is going down and the r naught is being driven down, and when it starts to get to about 1, the curve flattens. And when it goes down below 1, the curve begins to fall and eventually end the epidemic. Well, the reason is, if you look here, if everyone is susceptible, no one is immune, and you have an r naught of 3, okay, everyone infects 3 others. But when people start becoming immune, in other words, they become recovered and they develop immunity, then down here, if you have a situation where there are few susceptible contacts, most people are immune, you will have an r naught that may be one, where one person infects one. Or you get to a situation where there are so many immune people that r naught goes down below one and the epidemic ends. Now there's a major assumption here which comes to our first big unknown, and that is, will immunity develop? These simple SIR models assume that yes, immunity will develop, that the susceptible fraction will reduce. The problem is, we don't know that yet. 
We don't know whether immunity will develop after one infection. Will it take two or three infections? Another big unknown related to immunity is, can a vaccine be developed? Many countries and many companies are trying to develop vaccines, but we don't know how long it will take to develop a vaccine. There's another big unknown, and that is mutation. We know that there are many strains of the virus, but can the virus mutate and then develop a strain that a previously immune person is susceptible to? And the epidemic starts over. We want to believe that's unthinkable, but it is possible. God forbid that that would happen. Now, this dotted curve here is the original epidemic curve that we assumed without any social distancing. But look what the effect of social distancing and the lockdown does. It begins to flatten the curve. Just like up here, when the R0 begins to decrease and eventually go to 1 and then below 1, when you put into effect social distancing in a lockdown, R0 is reduced and it begins to flatten the curve. But what is the effect of this flattening of the curve down here on what's going on up here? What happens is that there are fewer recovered people because there are fewer people becoming infected. And because there are fewer recovered people, there are also fewer people turning from susceptible to immune. What ends up happening here is that there are higher numbers of people who are susceptible when you introduce a lockdown. So what happens to the full curve when you decrease R0? Well, when you have flattening of the curve, the curve will look like this. It'll be symmetric, just like the original curve without the lockdown. But there are two features I'd like to point out here. The first one is that the total number of new cases per day at the peak of the curve without the lockdown is much higher than the one with the lower R0. This has implications for the hospital care system. If you have many cases arriving in the hospital who need an intensive care unit, for example, this may overwhelm the hospitals. But if you have a lower R0, the peak is lower, and the number of new cases per day at the peak is lower. This is the main reason why many countries are introducing the lockdown. It's because they want to make sure that at the peak of the epidemic, the hospital care system can absorb all those severe cases. Now, the second feature I want to point out is that when you have a high R0, look at the duration of the epidemic. It's shorter, but when the R0 is lower, the epidemic lasts longer. Isn't that interesting? So, it's tempting to think that the curve will look like this. A lot of countries are right here. But remember that most of the population is still susceptible. The condition for this happening would be that you don't lift the lockdown. But remember, the R0 is low because of the lockdown, not because of the decreasing susceptible fraction. If you lift the lockdown, it's not going to go down because there's so many susceptible people. When you start lifting the lockdown, these susceptible people up here will become infected. So if you lift the lockdown slowly, the shape might look like this. And then the susceptible fraction will continue to drop. The recovered cases are increasing and the susceptible fraction is decreasing. However, if the lockdown is lifted too quickly, another smaller surge could occur. Why is it smaller? It's smaller because the susceptible fraction is shrinking, causing R0 further to decrease. So the R0 at this point in time, when you lift the lockdown, is lower than the R0 over here, because the susceptible fraction is decreasing and driving the R0 downward. However, there's another big unknown, is people's behavior. After lifting a lockdown, will people go back to normal? Or will they continue social distancing? If they go back to normal, the surge will be larger. 
If they keep social distancing, the r naught will be suppressed. There's another big unknown, testing availability. When widespread testing is available, combined with contact tracing, case isolation, and quarantine of contacts, those actions together mitigate the surge, and together they also decrease r naught. However, we are not sure how accurate these tests are. There are many companies developing tests, and some of the companies are validating them in not a very scientific way. So do we know if the tests are accurate? If there are many false negatives, then our surveillance is going to be less effective. We won't be catching all the cases. Our contact tracing and all the surveillance efforts that we do will be less effective. And it further underestimates disease occurrence. Another big unknown is that we do not know how many asymptomatic cases there are for every symptomatic case. And the reason for this is that very few countries have done widespread testing of the entire population. Let's take a look. These are the known cases here. But if there are many asymptomatic cases that we don't know about, we will be underestimating the true rate of immunity or the true rate of recovered because maybe there's a lot more recovered people in the community that we do not know about. That, that means that the susceptible fraction is lower. If the susceptible fraction is lower, remember, that will drive R down quickly. So if there are many asymptomatic cases, that makes widespread testing and contact tracing even more important. The last big unknown is whether COVID-19 will take on a seasonal pattern like influenza. If so, summer in the Northern Hemisphere will see a drop in the cases. However, what remains unknown is if that happens, at what strength would it return in the fall? So what are the major unknowns preventing precise predictions about when the COVID-19 pandemic will end? The first is questions about immunity. We don't know whether it takes one infection, two or three infections before people become immune. That would have a huge impact on how long the pandemic will last. Secondly, God forbid, if there's a mutation for which immune people are now susceptible again, that would change the dynamic of this pandemic. What about human behavior after the lockdown is ended? Will they go back to normal? or will they continue doing social distancing? When will widespread testing become available? And how accurate are those tests? And then the case isolation and contact tracing that, that must be part of widespread testing. A big one is how many asymptomatic cases are there in the community for every symptomatic case that we've diagnosed? Lastly, will COVID-19 turn into a seasonal pattern like influenza? As you can see, all seven of these big unknowns can each have a differing effect on the duration of the pandemic. Because of all of these, it becomes practically impossible to accurately determine at this point how long the pandemic will last. However, I do have some good news for you. Scientists all over the world are working day and night to find the answers to these questions. Some will take longer than others to answer, but as answers to more and more of these questions are discovered, the more accurate our predictive models will be. Thank you for listening to this lecture. I hope it explained to you how the epidemic curve works and how it applies to the COVID-19 pandemic. May God bless you and your family and keep you safe and healthy during this extraordinary time in the world.